Hi and welcome to SallyHughesBeauty.com um, We've had a bit of a break from in the bathroom because I was finishing my book um, but we are back and I'm so excited because for two reasons firstly we've got our first man ever um, on in the bathroom secondly we're not in the bathroom we're in somewhere altogether more special which I'll get to in a sec but thirdly when I first started this series and I was just kind of coming up with the idea and talking to the director my original hit list was I wanted to do Mary Greenwell first because I love Mary so much and I wanted to do Charlotte Tilbury, Val Garland and Sam McKnight that was my list and I thought anybody else is a bonus but I want to do those four um, and it's only taken three years, did the first three and finally I've got Sam McKnight here and it's timely because he has a new book out called Hair by Sam McKnight. It's absolutely beautiful, we'll talk about that in a bit. And also uh, Somerset House in London, their major winter exhibition this year is all about Sam's work spanning four decades. Um, he's done the most extraordinary stuff, has worked on every conceivable um, beauty and fashion campaign. Um, does the shows for Chanel, has done the most gorgeous shoots for Louis Vuitton, is so synonymous with the Vivian Westwood look. It's just the most ridiculous CV ever. So we're going to be talking about that. And then in part two, we're going to look at his kit as is customary in this series. So hello. Hello. Thank you for having us. Thank I'm you so for coming. excited. You were the last person on the hit list. Well, now we have I been can... trying for a while. We have been trying for a while. We've been trying for about two years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we just, yeah, we couldn't make the dates work out. And I had promised quite a few people at various events that I was going to be doing Sam McKnight. So I started to panic as the months went on that it was never going to happen. So I'm so thrilled. Here we that, are. Yes, that this has coincided. So this book, it's so beautiful. It, it's hard to, to explain because it's not just a hair book. So we are used to seeing hair books where it's kind of like, here's how to do a French braid and a, an illustration or some hands in photographs. But this is a retrospective, isn't it? It is. It's a retrospective and it's, it's, it's 40 years of work. So it's basically my favourite shoots over the last 40 years. And it's not just about hair. They're not necessarily all hair shoots. They're, the fashion is an integral part. The, it's split into sections. What I like about it, it's not really chronological. What you've done is you've picked out various themes. And there were loads of highlights for me, but the first one I want to talk about is the one that really um, made me fall in love with your work in the first place. When I was growing up and absolutely obsessed with beauty and fashion, and I would stick fashion shoots up on my bedroom wall as a teenager and thought, I want to work in that industry. Um, most of them were photographs involving you, Mary Greenwell, and the supermodels. Mm. And I think most people who love the supermodels, and I love them so much, really associate that kind of trilogy, that kind of trinity of creative talent. How did you start working with the supermodels? Um, I began to work with what now, who are now known as supermodels, um, when they were just Christy, Linda, and Naomi. Um, so how old? Kids? Like 16-ish or something? I began to work with those girls when they were, when Naomi was 16, yeah. So 16, 17, 18. And did you see something quite special in them from the off or did the whole phenomenon take you by surprise when it eventually kicked in? Well, they were, they were pretty special from the beginning, but the way it built um, took everyone by surprise, I think. I think by the time I, I began to work with Naomi and and Linda around 1985 and by the time 1990 hit they were massive global superstars so it, it happened it didn't happen overnight it, it was a slow a slowish burn you know there was since <clears throat> since the um, real height of the supermodels in the 90s I've interviewed quite a few of those girls and I do think there is something there is something quite different about them from, which isn't to denigrate everyday models at all, but there is a sort of sprinkling of stardust on them, I think, mm. that's a kind of inherent, they do seem like superheroes. They're so kind of, they're womanly and strong rather than girly and wafy. Um, how has that sort of aesthetic changed over the years? Because I, they looked very, very different, I think, from what had gone before or what came after. Well, they were, um, I think they were the first chameleons. They were the first girls who, changed their looks a lot because there were supermodels before but they were mostly all-american 
Yeah. Uh, it, it, was, it was a different time. And when Christy, Linda, Naomi, Tatiana, um, Cindy came along, those five, um, they were almost superheroes. They, they, were, they were a different build than girls are now. Right. They were equally at home in swimsuits on the beach as they were in couture on the runway. And before those girls, um, runway models and editorial models were very different. They didn't, editorial girls didn't really do runway. It was a different, um, it was a different sphere. There was, there was um, the, it, in the late 80s, there was the first time that runway and editorial actually mixed. And I suppose, I mean, you're absolutely right, I think, about the kind of chameleon-like nature of it. But one of the biggest transformations of that era that really, I think, turned Linda Evangelista into a mega, mega star was her cutting all her hair mm. off. That was a real hair moment, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, that wasn't me, though. No, but it was, it was hair became this really important, yeah. big thing, didn't it, with these sort of drastic hair? Well, Linda, Linda kind of made hair her own. Linda by, um, by changing it, by cutting it, by colouring it. And um, she did all that with Stephen Mizell, the photographer. I think Julianne Deese cut her hair off and changed her career. And then Linda became the hair chameleon. And you cut off um, Agnes Dane's hair, that didn't That was you? a few years later. Yeah. Yeah, Agnes was a few years later. And there was Kylie Minogue in between. Oh, yeah. Jenny Howarth in the 80s. I kind of do like a bit of a short crop on a do girl. You? Yeah. I always think if you suit short hair, it's almost like an obligation. Well, Tilda's kind of, it. Tilda's the sort of ultimate in modern short hair, I think, yeah. too, you know, with yeah. her buzz cut. That's quite, to, to end up doing um, runway, f from a hairdresser's point of view, to end up doing runway and big campaigns is quite a leap from being in a salon, mm. which is where you started mm. out. I remember in, um, when I first moved to London, one of the coolest salons was Moulton Brown, yeah. and I know that's where you started. What had you done prior to that to get you into this really great salon. When I first came to London in mid 70s, I worked in various salons. Uh, I worked quite a long time in Miss Selfridge in Regent Street. They had a salon there called Hairworks. Oh, really? Up at the back. It's where Massimo Dutti is now. And um, I worked in there. I had a great time. And then I moved to Elizabeth Arden on Bond Street, which is the big red door. Yeah. Which is where Louis Vuitton is now. Mm -hmm. And then after a couple of years, I moved to Malton Brown which was kind of the hot yeah. salon in the late 70s in London. And I kind of retrained there because I had to learn their methods and that involved a lot of using my hands and yeah. less reliance on hot tools. Yes, because Moulton Brown's sort of signature, at least as I remember it, was very much kind of working with hair rather than against it. It was. It was we were encouraged to use our hands and not have a tool as a barrier. So we sort of get right in there and cut hair and style hair using pin curls and that kind of thing, rather than blowing the hell out of it with a hair dryer and curling it with hot curling irons. And, and it worked very, very well. And it was, the, it was that era of sort of the beginning of that natural, they were the first to do that organic, natural thing with the products too. I had a set of Moulton Browners. Can oh, you I remember those, those yeah, yeah, the yeah. pink rags. Yes, with the yeah, wire, with the wire inside yeah. of her curling hair, with yeah. no heat involved too. Yeah. No heat. You used to put them in before bed oh, yeah. on damp hair yeah. and wake up. I mean, theoretically, you meant to wake up with ringlets. I did not wake up with ringlets. <laughs> I looked bloody awful. Um, do you think that 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 kind of more conventional training of hot tools, lots of product and so on, and then going into Moulton Brown where you were working with hair, do you think that kind of then shaped your future aesthetic as a session stylist? That combination definitely did shape my future. It, it taught me everything I know now. But then moving into the, the um, photographic world, um, I began to experiment a lot more than I ever did in the salon. So you began to experiment with different product products like using, using Coca-Cola. How would you use Coca-Cola? Products weren't as um, broad as they are now and weren't as specific. So we kind of had to make things up a bit. So we'd use a lot of homemade stuff. In fact, a lot of the products at Malton Brown were made 
in Michael and Caroline Collis's cottage in Wales from rainwater with seaweed. Wow. There was a seaweed lotion and stuff like that. So in a continuation of that, if I wanted a really strong set that took on a different texture that was kind of a bit conceptual, a bit odd, I'd use, um, I'd spray Coca-Cola into the hair because it made it sticky and Neat. sugary. Neat Coca-Cola in a spray can. And I still use that to this day. On kind of big jobs now, you'll still put... On big jobs, it gives hair an amazing texture. It, it, it makes it not like hair anymore. It's not for everyday use. No, and not in a kind of high insect area as well, I suppose. They'd be all over <laughs> exactly. your um, am, am I right in thinking that around about this time when you're at Moulton Brown, session stylists is a phenomenon and were not really a thing? W were hairdressers from salons going out to do session work rather than it being two separate workforces? Yeah, um, really, I, I did my first Vogue shoot in 1977. I, I replaced Kerry Warren because wow. Kerry, Kerry was the go-to hairdresser at Moulton Brown. Every cover on Vogue was hair by Kerry at Moulton Brown, which is kind of what I'd seen and I thought, oh, that looks pretty glamorous. I like a bit of that. Thank you, Kerry. And um, so I got to assist Kerry a few times. Um, thank you, Carrie. <laughs> and um, I went on a Vogue shoot on my own because I think he couldn't do it. I was double booked or something. So I was terrified. And that began a lengthy relationship with, with Vogue. Um, and, and what was the job? Was it a fashion it was a, shoot? It was an underwear job. It was a girl called Amy, shot by Eric Bowman, who I then went on to work with a lot. So that gave me an in to that world. And... Within three years, I had left the salon. I'd kind of taken a risk because back then, the job of just being a session hairdresser wasn't really, it didn't really exist yeah. because most people went for, worked in salons and that was the bread and butter and did the odd shoot. Because shoots, um, there weren't that many shoots. There really weren't, there weren't many magazines, there weren't many shoots and the biggest advertising job you could get was Freeman's catalog. Yeah which was coveted, you know? Yeah, catalogues still absolutely. pay well, don't they? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This was for Next Catalogue or anything like that. So there really weren't, wasn't anyone that I can think of that just did photo shoots. So I, know, I knew at the time I was taking a risk. I thought, I just don't want to work in the salon anymore. I, I really want to really give this session thing a go. And I left the salon in 1980 and I worked, I did a few, I did a little sort of few contracts with Daniel Galvin, but I never went back in the salon. I would do, I would, I would what we used to do was used to sell our credits. We used to, yeah. we used to sort of um, work in conjunction with the salon, but you didn't actually work there. Yeah. You do your clients there. And I probably had 10 clients a month, which, which when you're a hairdresser, I think once you've learned the trade, I thought, well, I could always go back to this. It's always a backup, which is very handy. But luckily I never had to. So presumably, at round about the same time, when you say kind of magazines are starting to um, increase in numbers, there are more shoots, you're able to go out on your own. Presumably at this time as well, we're also seeing the rise of the pop video. Yes, this, well, around 1982, I started to spend a bit of time in New York and I got to, the industry was much bigger in New York. Yeah. So I got to fairly early on work with my idols like Bruce Weber and Irving Penn and Avedon and I fairly, some very early shoots with Stephen Mizell, Patrick de Marchelier, many of whom I continued working with for a few years and I still work with Patrick to this day. Um, it, was, it was a great time in New York, the 80s. It was, it was, the energy was fantastic. It was pretty rough and dangerous, but it had a wonderful, um, regenerational thing about it because it was coming out of, of bankruptcy in the 70s. It, I mean, it was a dump and it was a dangerous dump. Yeah, lots of crime and fill. Yeah, but the, the, the downtown scene grew out of that and just to be a part of that was fantastic. The nightclubs were amazing. The whole, the whole downtown art and music and fashion scene was born in the early 80s. I, there is one pop video which um, I think I'm correct in saying was you, I hope I'm not wrong, which is one of the most iconic pop videos for women of my age, which is Uptown Girl. Yes. With Christy Brinkley. Yes. That video with her in the, in the hat and the black and white and the stilettos, that's, I think most women my age will think of that and the Robert Palmer videos. That really summed up the look 
of the era. You don't look was old enough to remember that. 14, what? I'm nearly 42. No, I'm not asking, I'm not asking. <laughs> um, Is that old enough to remember that really? God, yeah. Is it? Yeah, absolutely. You must have been. That, um, mm -hmm. Well, nerdy about, <laughs> nerdy about beauty from an early age, I suppose. But that video, um, I think, is so familiar to lots of women. Was that quite early on? Was that when it was really taking off for you? That was you? early on. I had been asked to do a couple of jobs with Christy Brinkley. We did a job, I remember it very clearly, we did a Stephen Sprouse story with Patrick Demarsley for Bazaar, where we gave her a big old sort of 60s beehive. And we, we kind of took Christy out of her kind of beachy supermodel 80s mm -hmm. look and we put a made this quite a statement Linda Cantella did the makeup and mm -hmm. I did the hair and then I did a I think the 1984 calendar with Christy and the Oscar ceremony so I began to work with Christy a bit and she asked us if we would do our hair and she asked myself and Mary Les Smith Masters the makeup artist if we would do our hair and makeup for something called a video which I'd never heard really of. Oh, yeah okay you know it's great the, the money was good and um, we turned up to this video and it was her boyfriend, Billy Joel at the time. And the song was called Uptown Girl. And I was quite horrified because she, she, had, she had to wear a hat yes. the whole way through the video. Yes. So we spent two days doing that and there was no hair in it until the final scene. She takes it off, she doesn't takes it she? Off and, and tosses she... her mane, yeah. 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 It was a big hair moment then. <laughs> it was a big hair <laughs> moment. Never imagining it would become the iconic video. Which I mean, it, it really became. is. Yeah. It has to be yeah. one of the most famous. But I think lots of those iconic moments don't feel like you're creating an iconic moment. They're kind of, or they, they become iconic More rather organic than. Yeah, you're doing yeah. I think this is a controversial viewpoint, but I was talking to a friend of mine recently. I think despite having been the writer on so many beauty stories for so many years and been a makeup assistant originally and worked with so many great photographers, I think hair is the most important thing in a Do picture. I really strongly believe that because if the hair looks shit, the whole picture looks shit. Mm. And you can, you may be able to, especially now, fix makeup in post-production or the lighting in post-production. But I think the hair is the thing that you look at straight away. And if the hair is wrong, it drags down the whole shoot, I think. Do you see your role as really integral to the picture? I do. I do see my role as integral to the picture. Yeah, I mean, I know it's often the first thing people look at, you know, because, really because so. the silhouette especially in a show or a cover. I mean, the, the silhouette, just the silhouette, the shape, can set the tone for the whole shoot. It's, yeah. it's almost like if it's a full length thing, it would be the hair and the shoes set the tone. Yes. As I often think, yes, if the shoes, shoes don't work with the hair, it's odd. You know, I often look at those two things. Because you're top and tailing. Top and tailing, yeah. I, but I think with hair, you, there's quite a lot of decisions to be made before you actually do the hair. You know, you, you, you have to decide on, is it going to be retro? Is it going to be modern? Is it going to be futuristic? Is it going to be minimal? Is it going to be maximal? Feminine, masculine, where are we going with this? You know, we need, I always need some kind of direction first because often you can waste a lot of time doing something that hasn't been thought out properly and to go back can be time consuming and time is of the essence, you know? Yeah. So I think, having some kind of guideline about but that's a discussion in the in the hair and makeup room always i want to speak to you about that because um in the book you um showcase um many of your british vogue covers and your international vogue covers um you as a hairdresser have created the hair on more vogue covers than any other stylist in history i believe um, which is quite amazing. That's what they say. But I wanted to know, there's a whole showcase of them in here, which I'll get to in a sec, but I wanted to know, what does that look like for you in terms of, so there's a Vogue cover coming up, somebody amazing is on the cover, let's for argument's sake say it's Kate Moss, who we'll definitely come back to, but say for argument's sake it's Kate Moss or Sienna Miller, maybe an actress, Sienna Miller, what happens? Do they just go through your booker, you turn up and do the hair, or is there a creative process before you ever get there? Um, do you know what you're doing or do you just turn up with a kit and work it out? I general, generally, I don't know what I'm doing till I get there. Really? No. I mean, unless there's a wig involved or something that I may have to prepare, that then I'll, I'll get a phone call from the stylist uh, and so we'll, there'll be a bit of prep involved. But generally to do a cover or something, it's, it's usually spontaneous. So 
so you're looking at, you come in, you're looking at the girl, obviously, but you're looking at the clothes, talking to the photographer, and you're working at, how quick would that be? 20 minutes, and then you're off? Yeah, it's, it's usually a quick chat with the stylist, editor, photographer, makeup artist. So the, the, the thing is with our work, well, you know that, it's a collaboration always. It's never about a single-minded um, um, way of doing things or, 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 or one person's um, idea that's got to come to it. It has to be, and it also if you're doing an actress or a well-known celebrity, it has to be something that makes them feel comfortable, that's right for, for whatever they're promoting at that time, you know, for their image at that time. It, it, there's all different kinds of things involved and every job is completely different. Whereas I suppose with a model, you've got a blank canvas and you can really take it anywhere without really you, bearing that stuff in mind. You can, but also you, you, even with an actress now, I think times have changed too. I think actresses, celebrities are so much more aware now of the fact that when they're doing a cover or a shoot for a magazine, they have to be a model. It doesn't just work anymore, the photo of them as themselves, because that is just not interesting enough, I think, to grab people's attention. It, it's all these days about the transformative um, powers or qualities of hair and makeup, really, and, and, yeah. and styling. Yeah. And I think they understand that. As in maybe 20 years ago, when, the, when actresses first started to be on covers, it was about maybe the pretty version of themselves yes. on the cover. Yeah, kind it's, of quite it, red carpet. Yeah, right? but it's, it's, um, it's quite interesting how that has changed, that dynamic has changed. Because to keep the interest, there has to be a constant evolution, I think. You know, to, 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 there has to be some kind of... Um, um, I, people are not going to want to see them as the same person day in, day out, you know? That's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's one, there are various sections in this book that sort of focus on different themes. There's, there's um, a section on the transformative powers of hair pieces and wigs and so on, which we'll come back to. There's a sort of uh, an archive-y um, Vogue section. But there is a whole section devoted to Kate Moss. And I wanted to speak to you about this because it seems completely correct that you have a section devoted to Kate Moss because your collaborations have been vast in numbers. And I suppose no model transforms herself in quite the same way. How has that relationship been for you professionally? Um, I met Kate when she was a teenager in New York. And um, we get along very well. I went through, because at the time she came along was kind of, I guess, the end of the, the sort of yeah. Amazonian supermodels. Mm -hmm. And she came along. Yeah. The wafy. She came along very, very different and really um, did remarkably well and, and, she did all and, right. and made it her <laughs> own. You know, she just made it her own. What is it about Kate Moss that has been able to always move with the times and people always want to look at her shoot? I think <clears throat> the camera loves Kate. She's got fantastic bones, structure. She's got fantastic facial structure. Camera loves it. She knows how to work the camera. She's almost like a silent movie star, you know, like all those girls, you know, they, they, they act in very small movements. Kate has a fantastic sense of style, you know, she's, yeah. she, she really is involved in the whole process of a photo and she's not, she, she won't rest until the best photo has been done, you know, so there's an attitude, isn't there? That there's there's an attitude, but there's also there's a, that, there's that wonderful thing with all these women uh, that, that there's there's a balance of power and vulnerability. You know that I think people look at Kate and she's not that her look is not that unattainable. I think women look at I Kate and can mean. relate to her. You know, because because she is she could be the girl next door. You know, she's not so distant. There's there's something touchable about her. Yes, it's not like that kind of Christy Turlington face that's like Sistine Chapel, beautiful, mm. where you just can't... I think also her, um, she's got such an energy about her and she's got such a, a sort of presence in, she's had such a presence, presence in the media that you kind of, people feel that they know her, you know, mm. they've grown up with her. Are there any particular shoots that, I mean, you've obviously picked out your favourites here. I mean, there are so many amazing Sam McKnight, Kate Moss shoots. The David Bowie one, I think, is one of my 
favourites. And the Vogue cover in the pencil skirt and the pussy mm. blouse is my favourite Vogue cover. Too, yeah. I just loved yeah. that cover. Um, is, are you still excited when you're going to do a shoot with Kate? Do you feel Always. like something magic will happen? Always, because, you know, she's really up for the transformation. She's up for taking on the character, you know, and that you don't, you don't know what that's going to be from day to day. What makes good hair in a model? What are you, what's the ideal hair? I think what makes a good hair shot is when your model knows how to work her hair, you know, because she can have the most amazing hair in the world, but if she doesn't know how to move her head or, or, or how to actually work her hair, do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Then you're not going to get the best shot. Kate knows how to work a hair, hairstyle. It's she knows how to work a wig. It's and funny. Yasmin Le Bon can, can throw her hair around like nobody else in the world. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. Expert hair thrower, Yasmin. <laughs> I think, I think they have, it's, like, it's like knowing where to put their hand or their leg. It's knowing where to put their hair to make it look good, to make them look good is an art. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because when I, I interviewed um, Francois Nars and I asked him um, the same thing about Kate Moss, he said she's just really, really good at modelling. Yeah. She just, she's it, so good at it. Yeah. She's, she's just great brilliant at, at being yeah, a model yeah. and that's the difference between yeah. a raving yeah. beauty and a yeah. raving beauty. She works amazing very, very hard at it and she understands the character. She understands what is needed from, from the shoot. Who um, else have you really, really loved working with? Um, are there any so, really I mean, special I love Giselle, really? I love working with Giselle, Giselle's great. She can throw hair. She can throw hair, she's just got the best hair in the world, Giselle. Um, Kate Blanchett's wonderful, Kate's great, she's really cool, she's, she's so beautiful. Um, and she's a great model. Uma Thurman is sort of otherworldly, divine, and I've known Uma since she was 15, so we kind of go back a long time. Linda is kind of just the... Um, consummate model. The consummate model, she really is. And Cindy's divine, all those girls. Tatiana had the, the, the best face ever, really. The, the most extraordinary, She's also unusual super clever, face. I think. Lovely, yeah, I she's great. Her oh, she is, yeah. Cover and I just thought she was so smart and interesting. Yeah. And that kind of intelligence comes through yeah. in her pictures, I always And think. Naomi's just, she's a dream to work with. She's, she's another one. I mean, they, they, all, they all know their craft so well. You know, I mean, they, they kind of, they set the bar, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, you've got, you've got lovely girls now like Carly Kloss. I mean, I don't throw the word supermodel around easily. And Carly's the, the modern epitome of a yeah. supermodel because she, she just... She works that camera really well too, and she's a trained dancer, so she uses those dance moves like nobody else. And, and the lovely Gigi Hadid is just great in front of the camera, you know? And Lindsay Wixon's amazing. Lindsay's amazing too. Lindsay's fantastic. I've got those quite a few pictures of Lindsay in the book. Yeah, she said those, I mean, her face know, is amazing, the little dimples. Yeah. And um, I love the shoots that you've done with her. You've worked with her a lot, haven't I've you? I've worked with Lindsay a lot, yeah. Yeah, no, I very much yeah, think she's of great. her as. Um, so, how. There's almost too much work. I know the exhibition at Somerset House. I don't know how you would condense four decades of such kind of gold chip work into that exhibition. What, where did you start? Did you start looking at the different elements of your work or just the things you were most proud of? Uh, well, I actually didn't curate the exhibition. The exhibition was curated by Shona Marshall and Shona had a plan. I think that's probably useful though, right? But yeah, because I wouldn't do have known where own, to start. Yeah. I mean, I would have put everything in and overcrowded it, but mm -hmm. I was kind of mm -hmm. held back. And um, sometimes by ropes. But um, <laughs> there are a lot of pictures in the book and they obviously couldn't all go in. So Shona's taken different elements and Michael Howes designed it beautifully. And there are, we've, got, we've got clothes involved, lots of wigs involved. We've got lots of tear sheets involved. We've got lots of actual prints involved, some giant prints involved. Um, it's not just pictures on walls. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of varied selection of different looks that, that I've done over the years. And some of my favorite things, some of my favorite things are not in there because there's no room for them. But um, I think it's a distilled version of the book that's hopefully come to life. I find that uh, when, when I first heard that you were doing the exhibition, I thought, I don't know what he's going to put in, because I think one of the things that people, that slightly bends people's heads about you, and I know from talking to other hairdressers, 
I just don't know. I think you do something like, I'm guessing here, about 16 shows a season, yeah. would you say? And you're doing that twice plus couture and cruise. Mm -hmm. And so, God, I mean, what's that? It's about 60 shows maybe over the course of a year, 50, 60? About 50 maybe, yeah. And each one is completely different from each other and each one is different from last season and the season before. Just Chanel alone, I don't know how you always make Chanel different. Well, Chanel's quite, I'm quite lucky to have Carl as an inspiration for that because Carl has a different inspiration for each show. So I can feed off that. I mean, his, his sketches are vastly different from one season to the next. And I try to, I always consciously try to not do the same thing twice. But you don't, I don't even know yeah. how that's possible. So how soon does that process start? Because there's so much wig work in the Chanel shows, yeah. you must have to start early. Well, we start that process two or three weeks before with sketches sent. Right, um, I would have thought months. No, no, no. Um, no, Carl sends me a sketch maybe a couple of weeks before of, of, of an idea that he has of a silhouette or a texture or just, just one little note and we pick up from that and we get one or two models here and we do variations on that and try out different hair pieces, different variations on things, slightly different shapes. And, so you and haven't seen clothes at this point, nothing? I've, just, I've, well, I've seen just sketches. sketches. And then I'll, I'll go in, if, I, if I'm in Paris, I'll go in and see Virginie and look at the clothes and have a discussion. And then I will send my digital images that we've taken the model and we'll kind of go from there and we'll kind of discuss things and maybe tweak things and then the week before the show we have a fitting and we do our looks then and then we have the week between the fitting when when the look is approved to the show to do all the hair pieces so and how many girls are we talking 50, sometimes 100? there's a hundred there anything from 50 something to a hundred so we're talking potentially up to a hundred wigs mm. Well, we, we usually end up doing, if it's 100, we might do 110 wigs because just in case there's a change of casting, so we might have to match another colour, so we have to overdo it. Right. So would you have your team, your full creative team here, making up the wigs? We'll sometimes have a dozen people here doing that, yeah, for a few days. And then, and then you have to get them over to Paris or to um, wherever the couture show is, which could be anywhere, frankly. Yes, yes. Texas or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just unbelievable. That feels to me like six months worth of work and you're doing that repeatedly every, every season. season. Aren't you knackered? I yes. Like, I came, I came to your 60th birthday party last year, which was, I hope you don't mind me saying... Um, 50th which was, birthday. <laughs> 50th. <clears throat> um, which was the most amazing party but i did just think i'm at a 60th birthday of somebody who works more longer more than the average 30 year old mm. do you not just feel fucked yes i do but that you know i always knew that i do yes do you ever want to scale it back just on I do, planes but it's not all possible. the time yeah do you ever think do you worry? I mean, you can't possibly be anxious at this stage about what might happen if you turn down a Vogue cover. No, I'm not worried about that. But I was never really worried about that, really, because um, I don't know. I just you t you take things as they come. You know, there's no big plan involved. You know, because you you kind of luckily the bookings have always kept coming in. Now that I've said this, they'll probably stop. Yeah. Yeah, this will be your you swan song. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all your fault. <laughs> things will start bill. drying yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do you feel that sort of sense of obligation to your long-time collaborative clients, though, like Chanel? You sort of feel that that has to be done no matter what because you're in a team. Chanel gets preference over everything else, yeah. really. Um, but there's lots of time to do other stuff. You know, there's plenty of time. I like to work every day and then I like to have a few weeks off, like a couple of weeks off after a big run of work. So it's like every day, but not day in, day, in, day out, all year. So you like binge working? I like binge working and then I like a week in the garden, you know? We need to talk about your garden. Yeah. So um, Sam is on Instagram and his Instagram is basically made up of the most beautiful sort of flowers and plants from your beloved garden and you in wigs. Mm. It's quite... Um, mm. It's quite a balance. What, why is your garden so important to you? Is that your little haven away that's from... That's my little haven away from people because that's, that's by myself, really. 
uh, whereas I'm surrounded by hundreds of people all the time. So it's Dry quiet. Noise. Yeah, it's quiet. It's kind of nobody talks. Flowers don't talk back to you. You know, flowers don't have an opinion. Thank God. Yeah. And um, I'm on my own. Solitude. Mm. And still has that creativity yeah, it's lovely. And, and texture and oh. so on. And what about wigs? So we've got wigs behind us, and we're going to have a little look at wigs in the next um, episode. But how did it start you shooting yourself in wigs? Because they're so funny, those pictures. Well, They've become a bit of an icon. It's new, on really. I've got a drawer or drawers full of old Polaroids from back in the 80s because we just use Polaroids all the time. And really, an iPhone is the new Polaroid, except we don't have them printed out. Um, and I've got drawers full of Polaroids of us in wigs, all of us in wigs, which, you know, give, give a hairdresser two hours of downtime and a, there's a bag of wigs there, somebody's going to try them on, you know? See, I, um, my friend Jason and I are obsessed with wigs, mm. whereas that I, I just think there's nothing funnier than a wig, there's mm. nothing more satisfying than a wig. And there's nothing more beautiful than a good wig. And there's wig. nothing more beautiful than a good wig. They're just... Wigs are totally brilliant and we used to throw parties. Well, they're parties. transformative, aren't they? I mean, they, they, you take on the character the minute you're wearing it. Exactly. And just sometimes the way it, the way it is placed makes it look completely different. <laughs> and we used to throw um, wigs and shoes parties. So it's really funny that you say hair and shoes and it makes the picture because we used to throw wigs and shoes parties where you had to wear... I've been to one of those. Have you? Yeah. It, super, super fun. <laughs> um, and they're just, they're irresistible um, to try on. There's a whole section on hair pieces here. Um, and the transformative power of wigs and hair pieces. And you do use them, I think, more than most stylists, would you not say? I, well, I think I it's know. become a trademark, your do you think? hair piece. Yeah, yeah, I definitely associate you with hair I pieces. I like and wigs. the, I do love the transformative quality of it, and it's instant and it's temporary. You know, it's gone at the end of the day. And I think people appreciate that because I'm not ruining their hair. They love yeah. it. And people actually love being transformed. It's fantasy, isn't yeah, it? There's it is. something so it fantastical yeah. about wigs. Um, I, I think it's easy for someone to step into character if there's a wig involved. Yes, yes. It's like putting on a, yeah. a costume, isn't yeah. it? It's so yeah. sort of fantastical. I can't not talk to you about. Um, I mean, we've talked about all these models and actresses, but there is one person with whom you worked a great do deal who definitely qualifies as an icon, and that was Princess Diana. Mm. How did that come about? We, I've spoken to Mary about this in a previous episode, and I'd, I'd love to know how you felt about that working relationship. Well, that, uh, Mary and I both met Princess Diana through Anna Harvey at British Vogue. Mm -hmm and Patrick de Marchelet, the photographer in 1990. And, but, you know, we were asked to do a shoot. She was one of the subjects, along with a few other royals. And um, we didn't know it was going to be her. That was a surprise. She came sort of bounding up the stairs wow. of the studio in Hackney and sort of a sort of long-limbed blonde lady. It was just utterly charming and disarming at the same time and had us all kind of laughing. And she was great fun from the beginning. And I cut her hair short that day and we got some lovely pictures and I got a lovely shot of myself and Diana, which is in the exhibition actually. And um, we just headed off and I started to travel with her and go on her tours to Pakistan, to Mother Teresa's and to Taj Mahal and all these amazing places that I would never normally have gone to. And I just, I, we, we had a lot of fun for seven years. What I think is so interesting about um, your working relationship with her is that when you started doing her hair, that was quite a big moment in her life, in the trajectory of her life. Um, I think round about that time was when she went out in that amazing black dress when the breakdown of her marriage had been um, discovered. And she was really stepping out as a single, effectively single, powerful woman, and she had the haircut to go with. That must have been quite an extraordinary thing to have created the hair for this moment where the entire world mm. is watching and, by the way, talking about the hair. Mm. But the thing is about that is because I was doing her hair on a regular basis, the eyes of the world were on it the whole time. Yeah. So you never really kind of, you know, you, I've never really planned stuff. There was one time when I slicked her hair back in New York when the, the, the press went completely bananas yeah. and that was... Um, 
But my mum and dad had to move out of their house because, no. oh yeah, yeah, because she let someone from a newspaper in, you know, she didn't know. And um, the next day in the headline was, he doesn't even do his own mother's hair. Well, he lives in London, she lives in um, Scotland, so of course he doesn't. But it was, it was hard for them. And I, the, the power of, of just how big it was hit home to me then. Were you able to see from that vantage point how sort of insane her life yes, was? Yes, I did. I did. I, I saw that at close quarters, you know. It is very, very unusual for a major um, cultural venue like Somerset House um, to focus on something in our world, in our industry. How did it come to you? And how did it make you feel? I can't imagine. Um, it came to me through... Um, my, I, I found a wonderful lady to put all my boxes of tear sheets from 40 years onto digital. Uh, her name is Tori Turk and she's a brilliant archivist and she also did archive for Somerset House. So right. she showed my archive to Somerset House. She asked if she could show it to Somerset House and I said, yeah, sure. And they approached me with the idea of doing an exhibition. Which I kind of first thought, well, you, people won't really want to look at that. But when they presented to me a plan, a sort of rough plan. I agreed, of course, because it's such a great honour, really. Really, you know? yeah. And um, really, I've just followed their lead by, because they know what they're doing in the, in the exhibition world. They know they kind of wanted to. They to, know how to tell the story. They, totally. they, 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 they told a good story, and they wanted to make it to, to show the cultural relevance of relevance, the, the, the sort of cultural aspect of of hair, and I think they've managed to do it very well. Yeah, and was the book already in the pipeline or was it a happy coincidence? The book was already in the pipeline, but we hadn't really figured out exactly how it was going to be. So after the exhibition, it kind of, it kind of fell into place. Although the book is not the book of the exhibition. No. The exhibition is kind of taken from the book, um, but there's far more in the book than there is in the exhibition. To, to what degree... Uh, I mean, you mentioned before that shoots are such a collaborative process, as we know. To what degree have your relationships um, really influenced your career, your relationships with makeup artists, with certain photographers? I know Nick Knight's been a really important photographer in your career and you in his. There's a section of the exhibition called Collaborations, and we have 10 beautiful giant prints of 10 of my long-term collaborators, um, Nick Knight being one of them, Patrick Demarchelet, Tim Walker, Craig McDean, Val Garland makeup, Mary Greenwell makeup, Karine Rockfield, Kate Feeling, Lucinda Chambers, Edward Enfield. So it's really, I guess the 10 people I've most collaborated with or created the most iconic images with. It's like a family, isn't it? Because the way Mary talks about you is as family. Yeah. Because you're shoved away on trips and in studios. No, I think Mary and I even shared a tent for a week in Utah <laughs> on, on a I rafting just, trip. I yeah. really like the idea of Mary being on the tent. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that um, she was thrilled yeah. about that. We had a great time, actually. I've got some amazing pictures I'll show you one day. Not allowed to put them on Instagram. Oh, bless. They, yeah, she, I mean, she talks about it very much as a family. You're, you're in such close quarters yeah. um, and you're creating something together. And I suppose the memories must be just infinite. Well, the memories are infinite. And you, you're with people, the whole team, throughout their lives, you know, throughout their sort of formative years in their life, some of the models from teenagers. So you kind of, you're seeing each other in your most vulnerable moments, first thing in the morning. Um, so you, be, you form strong bonds. I also think hair and makeup is quite unique in that it's so intimate. You are touching yeah, someone. It's intimate. You're yeah. right in their face yeah. and you are touching them. So mm. you kind of become the agony aunt, agony uncle. You do and you learn to respect boundaries because you know, sometimes, sometimes you don't want to speak. Sometimes the model doesn't want to speak. So you have to respect those. It's a relationship. Yeah, and I suppose you're the because you're in their face, you can be the sounding board when everyone yeah. is outside yeah. and there are tensions. Yeah, you're going to be the one that they chat to. Yeah. Um, do you have? Is it important to you to maintain a social life outside work, or are you fully immersed in it because of the nature of your schedule? I think I was fully immersed. Uh, I was fully immersed in it when I was younger, but now I tend to 
not socialize in the business like I used to. Um, I can have treasure my outside um, life and separate them a bit more. Do you, do you see people coming up and, and think that it's changed for them? Has it changed for new artists, whether hair, makeup, styling? Has the industry changed very much for those people starting up or do you see them beginning on a roughly the same path as you did? I don't know. I'm not in a position to say. I, don't, I, 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 I would have to be in their shoes to, to, to comment like that. But I, I would say that the industry is massive now. Um, the opportunities are greater, but the competition is greater. Um, the disposability is different, the, 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 the speed of it. Um, I'd say it's quite different. It was much, much smaller when I started. It's a whole different kettle of fish now. So I, I don't know how it feels for a young one. What it looks like from where I'm standing is that it's pretty tough lots of competition. Yeah. You um, headed up a mastered um, course mm. and I taught on um, Val's mastered course and it's really interesting to see all these sort of young artists coming through asking how, how do I start, how do I start, what, what advice would you give anybody watching who really wants to break into this industry? Um, I would say that for me the best way to get started in hair or photo shoots and shows is to assist someone like me. And that means persistent phone calls to all the agents. You can find the telephone numbers or the, or the um, um, email addresses of. Just, just be persistent, but also be prepared to work. Be prepared to work and to give up your life for a while. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's really yeah. full on, isn't yeah, it? It's full on. Up. It's full on. I, I think most people will be desperate to know what it is you are using to create the looks that have made you so well known in the industry so I want to have a peek into your kit. Okay. So we are now going to take a break and we will be back next Saturday with Sam McKnight's kit. So I'm going to say a, just a very temporary goodbye and thank you to Sam McKnight. Thank you. But we will be back very shortly in seven days from now to look at Sam's kit and learn about exactly what he uses to create the most amazing images that are now available to see at Somerset House and the exhibition is already on and it finishes March 12th, mm -hmm. March 12th, yep. I think. And the book, Hair by Sam McKnight, which is such a thing of beauty, um, is out now also um, on Rizzoli, New York, and it's, it's available in all good bookshops and on Amazon. So see you next time. Bye, thanks for watching.